as um, has been already introduced, um, Bach Basis for Actuelle Kunst, which is an art institution in the Netherlands, is an art institution that tried to operate in that field between art, politics, and to great extent, theory. As also has been mentioned, we've been working together with Leona Stahl for a quite long time, and specifically on the, of the projects of New World, which include New World Academy, New World Embassy, New World Summit, and specifically the last iteration of it called Stateless Democracy. Now, allow me to put together a couple of notes um, to briefly introduce this session from within these collaborations, um, because we want to look at the Rojava revolution through a very specific angle, and that's the angle of art and culture, and specifically the role of culture in the processes of self-determination. Now, I mentioned I would like to talk a little bit about a few projects we've been, we've been involved with, uh, together with Jonas, and particularly two projects. So, as the first one, I'm, I'm going to briefly mention the New World Embassy Azawad. As you already hear in the title of this project, um, it's a, in some way predecessor to this embassy, but I want you to join me in some kind of imaginary geographical dislocation because this would bring us to Mali in Africa, and specifically the northern part of Africa that has been declared the state of Azawad. As I mentioned in 2014, uh, we have established New World Embassy Azawad at the institution I run, I have a privilege of working with in Utrecht, the Netherlands, together with Musa Ag Asarit and Jonas Dahl. And Musa Ag Asarit is here with us and he will, he will later on this afternoon join us for a panel uh, discussion to elaborate in detail about the embassy and the importance of the embassy for the struggle of the Azawadian, Azawadian people. Now, um, as I mentioned, this brings us to what the, the north of the state that we know as Mali, where the MNLA, National Liberation uh, Movement of Azawad, in 2012, declared the independent state of Azawad. It was a result of very complicated and lengthy struggle um, conflict-ridden struggle with and against the legacy of Western colonialism in Africa, and Azawad remains unrecognized entity until today. Are you still with me somewhere in your thoughts in the north of, uh, north of Mali? The sta state of Azawad remains unrecognized, but it does exist nonetheless. And to quote the Jonas Dahl words, exists, it exists through language, through poetry, through music, literature, as well as through visual signs and imagery. It is art that carries the history of a people and with it, the promise of a new world. Now, if I wanted to quote some other words, I would turn to the words of an artist, Azawadian artist, Mazu Ibrahim Touré, who actually is very vocal about the importance of art and culture in the struggle, uh, like the one we're discussing here when it comes to Rojava revolution or the struggle of the, of the Azawad. Um, Mazu is uh, an artist, a calligrapher, and a radio personality, and he's absolutely convinced uh, that art is, pr uh, art is something to play a very crucial role. Art is that which gives people a voice. He speaks very, in a very animated way about slogans, banners, being a poetry of revolution. Art is of great importance, he says. Not only visual art, the written word or music, but also the art of satire. Also, the work that he is, he is doing as somebody who's running Azawadian radio. Once again, the, the people, he says, speak through the artist. 
I will leave this case hanging there and we will return to it later because I think it would be important being here in the New World Embassy Rojava to understand what the New World Embassy like this, which is essentially an artistic project, can actually do in the, in the real world, let's say, or in the world of, of politics. So this was one example, New World Academy Azawats, as a predecessor to this one. And I would like to touch up on another platform, New World Academy. Why I'm mentioning this? Because I would like to draw some lines of solidarity with this particular project. New World Embassy is a school, is an academy, uh, pardon, pardon me, it, New World Academy is a school, is an academy also established uh, uh, by Jonas Stahl and his organization together with the organization I run. It's envisioned as a platform for learning and exchange to rethink the dominant forms of representation. Representation in art and in politics, specifically in times like ours. To be very concrete, what such New World Academy does, it brings together representatives of various progressive political organizations, uh, representatives from a variety of political struggles and artists and students to be together in a very kind of intense situation where they learn from one another as to what the role of art and culture can, should and must be uh, nowadays. We've organized five iterations just for your information uh, now because that could be quite interesting to look at the cases of other struggles. We organized such uh, academy with the National Democratic Movement of the Philippines, with the Amsterdam-based collective of undeportable, undocumented uh, refugees in Limbo, for example. We worked with the international pirate parties, with the National Movement of the Liberation, uh, for the Liberation of Azawat, as I mentioned. And the last one was specifically realized under the name Stateless Democracy, uh, together with the Kurdish women's movement. And I'm waving with this book. Um, it's available online. It's important compendium volume of extraordinarily texts and interviews coming from within um, the Kurdish women's movement. Really hugely important. And I think um, uh, the very fact how often it gets downloaded and read by people around the world already attests to the fact that the lines of solidarity across the world with Rojava revolution that we would like to cherish and harness throughout this conversation. Now, the idea of the New World Academy, New World Summit, New World Embassy is to assemble people, not just like that, but because we feel that there is something we have in common. It's not just to study the struggles that appear far away, somewhere else in the world, but understanding that we are part of the struggle, that we can contribute to winning that struggle, and that struggle is actually not theirs, but ours. And I think that's really important. Now, if you look around here, this is also a sort of an assembly. If I look around assembling artists, architects, curators, theorists, scholars, and specifically a variety of Kurdish communities. I want to see how we can understand all of us in the room to be artists. That we dismiss that notion that there are they, the artists, who, who have some magical power to imagine a better or another world, and then the others. I want us to act here today, all of us as artists who have capacity to imagine, articulate, and embody that kind of other world that we, that we imagine. Now, in order for this not to be just a panel discussion, we do this in the art world and in the, in the universities and academia. We talk, we talk, and it's very important talk, and it's imagining other worlds, worlds that are different from those uh, we accommodate, um, we, where we imagine the ways to be together in this world otherwise. But I think we need to move beyond imagining these worlds and try to see how together we can enact those worlds. How can we make those worlds we all desire really take place? Now, being this embassy, we are in an embassy. 
very different embassy that the embassies I know and negotiate very often. How do we use this as an opportunity to not just be another discussion, but actually that we together enact something like an art and culture department of that very embassy to draw lines of future policy of an embassy that will represent, and one day it will, the world we really want. So I really would want all of you to join me in this sort of effort. I hope I will manage to not just control time, introduce the speakers, but inspire you to get into this conversation, to become part of this conversation. And once again, not just of imagining models, but making those models reality. Before we start doing this, we have an amazing keynote speaker that is going to speak to us. One of the ambassadors of this wonderful, uh, wonderful embassy, Sina Mohammed, who is going to present her, her keynote. Just a sentence of introduction for Sina, who is a foreign representative of the democratic self-administration of Rojava. She has represented the self-administration in various opening representation offices for Rojava all over Europe and beyond, including Berlin, Stockholm, Paris, and Moscow. And this is where I leave it for now and invite Sinem to deliver her keynote. Thank you very much. I think so. Dambash, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, friends of Kurds, friends of humanity, we are here in very significant place. It is the Rojava administration embassy. You are all welcome in the embassy of Rojava. You are all, it is really a very small place for all the people to be in our embassy, but we are really very sure that our heart is very big to have you all together here. Thank you for coming. And I would like in the beginning to thank all the organizations who established this, the World Summit, new sum, uh, World Summit, and even the mayor of the Oslo city, I'd like to thank you all here who are coming to listen to us. And we'd like to open our hearts and talk about what is going on in our place, in Rojava, in this small place as the embassy of Rojava. Thank you very much for your coming. And I would like to thank also Ms. Maria. Uh, and in the beginning, our, our topic is a little bit different from the politics, as I say. But we have to know that culture, arts, they are not a way of separated from politics. They are not. Everything in this life is related to politics. But everything in simple or different ways as we understand the politics. So, in Rojava, when I say Rojava because this is the, ambassador, the embassy of Rojava, I mean the representative of the Kurds, the Arabs, the Assyrian, Syriac, all the components who are living in Rojava together. This representative, all these people. It represents their cultures their colors, their policy. We can't deny anyone here. We are all here in this embassy. Let me go back first. Mesopotamia's region, or the, the word Mesopotamia. Thousand years ago, everybody knows that in Mesopotamia, different people that were living there 
uh, multi ethnicities, multi religions, they were living in very peace. But when the authorities, when the nation states started, these will, we can say, now disappeared. We have one nation state, one language, one nation, which is maybe Arabic nation, and this is what happened in Iraq, in Syria, in everywhere in the world. You can see only uh, in our Middle East, I'm talking, you can see only one religion, one language, one nation. Let me talk to the, the Syria, as the uh, Arab Republic Syria. It is an Arab Republic Syria. But the people who are living in Syria, they are not all Arabs. So in these words, you are denying the identity of these people. And when you deny the identity of any nation, that means you are denying also his culture, his language, his arts. For that, denying the cultures, the arts, the language, the feelings of the people, you are denying all this nation. For that, when the Rojava administration or the Rojava revolution started, 2011, and it was started actually in Syria under the name, or not in Syria, even in Tunisia and Egypt, under the name of the Arab Spring. Everybody heard about the Arab Spring. For me, I don't like to call it Arab Spring. I prefer to say it's a people spring, because this spring is not only for Arabs. It's for all the people who are living in this region. Kurds, Arabs, Assyrians, multi-religions like Muslims, Christians, Yazidis, Alawis, and Durzis, and so on. So this is the revolution of all these people with their nations, with their religions, with their identity. In the revolution of Rojava, we can call it the revolution of women, as my colleague Asim Asya Abdullah mentioned. And we can call it also the, revol the cultural revolution. Why cultural? Because we deny the culture of the nation that time you can have the uprising to get back your culture, to get back your arts, your songs. And this is what's happening, actually. When we say any artists, painters, singers, writers, poets, all these people, they reflect the daily life of their society. And they reflect the feelings, the hopes, the pains of their people. So if we really just deny all this and prevent him from doing all these things, what kind of art do you, th do you have? Do you think it is a real art, natural art? It is not, I don't think. So, in this revolution of Rojava, we got back the nature of the culture. We ask our people to go and to, to live, to, to alive their cultural, natural cultural, natural lives, natural songs, even their folkloric dress, it is one of these cultures. So, when I talk about Syria during the Abbas regime, that time, let me talk about the Rojava. How was the situation there? How was the, the people celebrating their events, festivals, and so on? When I talk about Kurdish people, that time, we were prevented to 
even have the songs, Kurdish songs. It's forbidden. Imagine if I heard some music, Kurdish music, I would, was very, very happy. Oh, it's a Kurdish. But the singer was Arabic. He was spe uh, singing in Arabic. So the songs, the music of the Kurds was assimilated, melted. Nothing, no identity for it. This is what happened. Many singers in Rojava, because they sing their songs about the freedom of the Kurdistan, it is a dream for everybody, they will be punished and put in the prison. Many examples of them are there. One of them I heard, I, I remember you now his uh, name, his uh, name is Hikmat uh, Jamil, uh, his name. That time he have a song about the Arab belt, which is the Syrian Ba'ath regime. They impose it on our people and remove the Kurds from their own land, historical land, and they replace it with the Arabs. That singer, he wants to express his feeling against this act. He was punished and he was in the jail, then he came to Europe. This is one example. If you want to, a writer to write something about his feelings, about the suffering of the Kurdish people, he can't. He couldn't. If you have a library, the shop for books only, Kurdish books are there, maybe Kurdish stories for the children, it was forbidden. And the owner of this library, he was in the jail that time. So this we can talk about the denying of the culture of the nation. And in this way, we have many, many examples about poets, poems, everything it is inside here. Everything, it's here in my mind, but I can't express it out. I can't. This is the problem. In the revolution of Rojava, it was completely different. You can see that time, many, many poets come out. Many singers who sing the very beautiful songs for the Rojava revolution. Because in the revolution, going together in parallel, arts, policy, as a politic, and even the administration, and the war. War will go together with the arts. Maybe all of us, we heard, many songs will be urging the uh, fighters and to resist more, and to be very, very having a morally, you know. This is what happened, actually, in every revolution, in every war in the world. You can see every war accompanying with the very revolutionary songs. And now, we have a lot, thousands of it. Why? because the people, they can express their feelings, they express their pains, they express their happiness in this revolution. They are free. They got the freedom in their hand. If you are free, you can do everything. If you are free, your mind will be having a very imagination to imagine very beautiful things. This is what can ha is happening actually in Rojava. Let me again say another thing during the Ba'ath regime. Our other components who are the nation of the Assyrian, Syriac nations in Rojava, we are neighboring each other. We are living with each other thousand years ago. But these nations which they, they, uh, that they speak, their own language, which is the Aramaic language, 
which is the language of Jesus. Most of them in Rojava that time, in the, during the Ba'as regime, most of them, I think Mr. Bassam is half, he's one, maybe now he's learning, they don't speak this language. They can't speak their language. They are melted in the culture of the Arabs. They are melted in the culture and the, 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 the life of the Arabs, which they, they impose it on us. When I talk about the Arabs, I am not against it. You have to, um, to know that. When I say that they are melted in the Arabs, we also been also the Arabs culture imposed on us. I'm not against the Arabs. But we have the revolution for the Arabs themselves. Because we face very great challenge, which is the chauvinist of the Arab mentalities. These chauvinists, they who pre uh, prevent us to have our own language, culture, music, poems, everything. That time, Assyrian, they can't speak their language, the Aramaic, the, the Jesus language. Imagine that. Now, they are really, I'm so proud to see the, most of them now, having schools to teach their people the Aramaic language. So this is related to the politics. It is in the politics itself. They have now their cultures, centers for their cultures. We have the center of the culture, which is the committee of culture in Rojava administration that is, we can say, the Ministry of the Arts and Culture in Rojava. It is not named Arabic Center Cultures, like before, like in Bas. It is named under the name of the committee or the Center of the Arts and Cultures for Arabs, for Kurds, for Assyrians, for everybody. Not only Arabic culture, not only Kurdish culture. And this is what's going on there. So, if I talk about all these things, I think we can relate politics, arts, and war, fight, all together. All together we can connect them together. I can just say one thing. During the Kubani, everybody knows the historical struggle of Kubani and resistance. During that, we have this, the, the, the fighting in Kubani, the resistance of Kubani inspired the poets, the writers, the singers to express their feeling about Kubani. So it's inspired them. They express, they write, these writers and the singers, poets, they wrote thousands of poems and epics about the struggle of Kubani and about the lives of the martyrs who sacrificed themselves in Kubani. And it is an amazing stories. Amazing poets comes out. Why we didn't have it before? Because we are not able to do it. Our, our mouth is stopped, closed. Nobody dare it. Nobody dare to say, I want to sing a Kurdish sing song. Nobody. Believe me. And now we have, if you go to, to, to Rojava, you can see the folkloric dress for all these nations who are living there. The Syriac nations, Syriac people, they have their folkloric dress. The Kurdish, the colorful, beautiful. I never seen any of the Assyrian folkloric dress 
only this type for revolution. I was like, I like it too much, really. It's something amazing. Colorful thing in your garden. You don't have only one flower color. You have different colors. And if we have different colors, we have very rich garden. So I can say that diversity, it doesn't mean to weaken this country or Rojava. On the contrary, it is enrich. Enrich this culture. Enrich our arts and music and song, our, our culture. For that, we say unity through diversity is our aim. No denying anybody's uh, uh, nations, cultures, identity. It is for working together to enrich our life and to have a good, good relation with all over the world. And this is our aim for the embassy here, the embassy of Rojava, to have the relation with the people. The people here in Norway, the people in Europe, because we have many representation office there. It is for building the bridges among the people and which is the strongest one, believe me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sinem. Thank you very much. Uh, perhaps a question or two. Um, you called the Rojava revolution culture revolution. And I think that's something we should not let go unnoticed. And maybe um, also in relation to the term that was articulated in the previous panel in the, um, in the relation to confederalism. It was called culture confederalism. And that's something that struck my mind. And I wonder whether you want to touch up on that, that, that notion of culture revolution that you, that you used in uh, articulating that there's no distinction between culture and politics. And some, that's something that we would need to maintain. And how do you see that in relation to that notion of uh, culture confederalism? When I say uh, politics and culture, they are not separated. I mean here, when you have the policy, political system, which impose one culture on you, that time you will not have any democracy. The, the, the confederalism, democratic system, will open the gate for all the cultures, for all the nations to come out with their arts, with their feelings, with their music even. So for that I can say there is no differences. Always they are related to each other. If you have a democratic system, federal system, confederalism between all these uh, centers of the cultures, that time you will have the unity through all this, uh, among all these centers. And this is what I mean. That means we have the, uh, the democracy in the policy, stateless, we can say democracy, call it. That time we have the uh, uh, policy that open the way, open your gates very wide to have multi cultures and multi even uh, arts and everything. Thank you. Perhaps um, another question. We at the embassy, I've stressed it a number of times, we know it, but I want to bring one very strange paradox and tension in. Embassy is a traditional trope of a nation state. Yeah. Now, that's not what we are, that's not what we represent, and yet we are the embassy. So my question would be, how does an arts and culture policy of an embassy of stateless democracy, like the one we represent, differ from just a business as usual of a regular embassy of a, any nation state. So where can we start articulating a difference? In other words, where are we going to do things differently and otherwise? What is that 
shift? What is that difference that I believe we need to start articulating? Uh, when I say the, the stateless embassy without the states, it all, okay, it's very different. The state embassy represents the state, the top of the state, the government. It doesn't represent the people in this area. Stateless means representing all the people. For that, when I start my speech, I say, here this, the place which represent Kurds, Assyrian, Arabs, Turkmen, Shashan, and multi-religion and multi-nations here in this embassy. So it is the representative of the people here. And when you have the representative of people, you will have multi-cultures, multi-arts, different kinds of arts. And in each embassy, you can see the work or the, the, the mission of the embassy is a diplomatic, maybe, something like that. But here, it won't be only diplomatic. Of course, it, there will be a department of diplom diplomacy there to have the relations. But it is also, you have here, let us say, Department of Culture and Art in the embassy. So this is what we need, really. We need to have departures or the, the Department of the Culture and Arts in, in each embassy so that we can make events, so that we can know each other, cultures of each other, the people, the other people also cultures. It's so important. Maybe nobody in Norway knows the culture of the Kurdish people, unless if I make an event in the embassy here about the culture, the music, the folklore, and everything. When I say art, I mean art, it means not only painting or doing only things, no. I think the style of your life is art. It is. Even in, in designing your house, it is an art. Even in agriculture, it is an art. You can find some people, farmers, who is farming, planting his land in a very beautiful artist, art, in, in art way like this. This is an art. And in Rojava, we have agriculture. And this agriculture, as an agricultural place in Rojava, we can live on it. We have wheat, we have fruit, we have olives, we have everything so that we can get all whatever we need in this, uh, on our land from our Rojava. And it is a kind also of art. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Can I use this as an opportunity to invite panelists to join us here? For those of you who really read the program, I have a proposition to make that we skip the 10 minute break. We push through, we gain some time and some space to talk together. Agree it? Thank you. So on that note, stay with us. Stay with us, if, if that's fine, yes. I would like to invite Chela Sheikh to join the table. I would like to invite Musa Agasarit to join us, together with uh, Ernst van den Hemel, who has been so generous <laughs> to translate for Musa. And I would like to invite Laura, Laura Rajkovic, to join us, um, join us at the table. It's an extraordinary panel. We, I have to admit, had a little coffee together, and I was like, oh my goodness, we need three-week conference to touch up on all these issues. But um, are we going to take it step by step, question by question, panelist by panelist? And I'm going to start with Shayla. Just a, uh, by means of brief introduction, Shayla is a lecturer at the Center for Culture Studies at Goldsmiths College, University of London. It should work. I think the moment you bring it closer to your face, it will do, it will do its work. Well, speaking of Goldsmiths, University of London, where she convinced the MA, uh, MA Postcolonial Culture and 
global policy. Prior to this, Sheila, you were involved in very interesting and I dare to say important project as a research fellow and publication coordinator on the Forensic Architecture Project based at the Center for Research Architecture. Um, you received uh, your PhD in history from Goldsmith with I am the Martyr X, Philosophical Reflections on Testimony and Martyrdom. And currently, I think this is very important also to relate in relation to the last statement you seen and made, you looking, um, you're working on a multi-platform research project around colonialism, botany, uh, and the politics of the soil. So I want to take it from, uh, from their start there. And of course, I know that as an academic and a teacher, you actually read quite a lot of texts. I also would hope from this, uh, from this reader on stateless democracy. And I would be really, really interested what ideas from this particular case of stateless democracy, from the particular condition of Rojava revolution, uh, you brought in into your teaching, into your thinking about the post-colonial and decolonial condition, uh, condition today. And that would be interesting precisely with the last comment of Sinem to connect to, to those issues. So please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Maria. Um, to connect to the issues of the planting as art. Okay, this is gonna take a little while in that case. Um, just first of all, it's an incredible pleasure and honor to be here. And I think now I'm hearing double. Everyone? Oh, okay, all right, I'll try. Um, just to give a little bit of background, so the program I teach in London is basically the idea is to look at a variety of issues around contemporary globalization through the lens of post-colonial studies. And I think very much like what we just heard about the title of after belonging, when we say post-colonial, we don't mean a temporal post by any means. Um, and I think one of the, the core aims of the program is to show how even though the historical phenomenon that we know as colonialism is officially over, um, more or less, actually <laughs> traces of colonialism or what we can call coloniality do persist all around us and are very, very much tied up with the modern idea or modern construction of the nation state. Um, so the case of Rojava and the Rojava revolution or Kurdistan more broadly is really exemplary insofar as, as we've heard a few, day, few times already today, Kurdistan really is an internal colony. It's really living proof of the way in which colonialism has simply not gone away. Um, so the construction of a modern nation state, we see, I mean, we can critique the way in which the state is at once the guarantor and also the violator of human rights. We can critique the way in which the modern nation state or the state forecludes, let's say, forestalls democracy. We've heard a lot about that already today, so I'm not gonna belabor that. Um, so there's a lot of elements, also this sort of triangulation between colonialism, the state, and patriarchy. We've heard about this a lot already today. So actually what I think is perhaps more interesting is actually to talk a little bit about it, not so much in relation to the content of the teaching, post-colonialism, but actually in relation to pedagogy. Um, and we've already heard quite a lot from various speakers about the importance of teaching and pedagogical structures in the Rojava Re Revolution. Um, and going back to the publication, it was actually, it was actually in the context of uh, weak teaching about the nation state that I didn't teach stateless democracy myself. I wouldn't want to, I'm interested in it. I don't feel like I have the expertise in the Rojava context, and I think that's sort of something that we need to think about, who has the right to speak for a certain topic. Um, so for that reason, I invited someone who I'm sure many of you in this room know, Dila Dirik, who's an absolutely wonderful academic, but also an activist who's working with the Kurdish women's movement. And I bring her in because basically for me, she... In the lecture she gave, she encapsulated so many things that I think are really core for us today. 
insofar as she was able to, and I don't want to embarrass her, but she's probably somewhere in the virtual world, one of our virtual uh, addressees, she was able to narrate a history and a theoretical background, but also to make it communicable. And I think that seems to be what we're trying to get at today, and it's what Maria was already bringing up, not only today, but also in Utrecht, when Maria was talking about a common vocabulary that we need to find. As we've already heard, it's more urgent than ever to find that vocabulary with the rise of right-wing populism, um, with Trumpism and so on and so forth. We, as people who are working within academia, art institutions as well, there's a pressure even more than ever to find a common language, one that doesn't eliminate difference, and hence there's an importance for the no notion of the translator or the person the figure of the translator. So someone like Dila was exemplary in that, seen him as well in terms of being a kind of spokesperson for a cause who can translate a cause because we're also thinking about the translatability of the Rojava revolution from the very specific on a global context. So there's a slight paradox I was just thinking at play insofar as everything we've heard today is talking about giving a whole community a right for self-representation. And yet within that, you actually need certain individuals to rise up and to translate those concepts over. Um, Can I, I ask about the concept of ecology? Yeah, yeah. And in the, in the little green book that all of you received, there is a wonderful text by Amina Osse, where she's looking at the social ecology or ecological society. And that's a really, really important, crucial element um, in, in Rojava revolution and uh, in the entire concept of stateless democracy. And this is this idea of botany or ecology. Uh, that's something you've been looking at. So can we understand, how can we understand ecology as part of culture and political struggle yeah. would be my question, basically. Yeah. Okay, so everybody who has the book, if you open it on page 63, there's a page where Amina is talking specifically about towards an ecological society. And this is something that's intrigued me for quite a while about the Kurdish struggle, and especially in Rojava, this notion of a social ecology. So just to read, she's saying, we, we see ecology as the basis of society. We even regard ecology as the science of society. So again, I see this as a, another sense of translation. A, I don't know the local word for ecology, but when we have the word ecology in English, ecology can mean a lot of things. So it can mean a set of relations between various organisms within an environment, or it can mean a more sort of concrete, literal sense of the way in which we as humans interact with the nature around us. So we see how ecology can be used in the sense of political ecology as well, but actually as we've already begun to hear a little bit about already, there is a very, very strong link with agricultural practices, and this again links in with colonialism. So if we think about colonialism having always historically been based upon notions of cultivation, the two have gone hand in hand. So colonialism seeks to conquer, let's say, a land that the colonial lens sees as empty, a terra nullius to be conquered, to be cultivated, to extract profit from. In the same way, colonialism has always sought to cultivate the peoples who inhabit those lands, to impose a culture upon them, to impose a monolithic culture upon them. So we see a sort of translation between um, practices of monocultures, planting of monocultures, high yield, highly productive modes of production and cultivation, and also the imposition of monocultures upon ecologies of identities, let's say. Um, I would even risk the proposition, since we're talking about culture, that potentially we could see all culture as colonial in some way. So maybe that's our task to think about how to make it less colonial. Um, where else to go with this? I think also, you know, it need, we need to think about practices of cultivation 
um, in terms of a kind of what we can call an epistemicide. Mm. So an eradication of local forms of knowledge, an eradication of relations with the environment and the soil um, and plants that are really reflected in local traditions and cultures. So then our task would be, well, how to create, I mean, you spoke of creating new worlds, how to create new ways of relating to our environment that rely on the commons, for instance, as opposed to the enclosures, um, that rely on a sense of community that isn't, that's based on the communal as that which is held in common, that's not based on an economy of profit, that's based on a sort of sense of nurturing and caring for the environment. Um, no, I and think I think Roger very is exemplary in that, insofar as one sees these very concrete practices that are beginning to diversify the mm -hmm. types of planting, the cooperative structures, the education, the eco ecological education, and also, as you're saying, so planting as an art practice. Mm -hmm. Maybe to touch up on forensic architecture project. Yeah. I know the project has been changing and it, uh, it uh, moved forward, but the whole project of forensic architecture is quite of interest for us here, I think, because the group, artists, theorists, academics, architects, activists, actually looked at um, architecture to provide evidence, huh? forensic architecture, to provide evidence about war, about war crimes, um, uh, devastation of uh, various, uh, various forms. Can you explain at all, in this context, standing in a on an architectural side in a way, um, how architecture can be used actually in relation to social justice? And I noticed throughout the day that the word architecture has been used multiple times in very different ways. In the very first keynote, we talk about the question of new world and how do we envision architecture of the new world, right? So it's speaking about language that we are building among ourselves. That would be quite interesting to touch upon, but for now, I would like to really focus on that question. Could you explain how architecture can be used in relation to social justice? For example, when it, when it comes to cases um, such as the violence perpetrated against the Kurdish movement in Turkey and Syria, and I would like to know whether forensic architecture has engaged in any such, or yeah. plans to engage maybe with any such cases. Yeah. Okay, so just a little bit of background. There's, uh, the, the project Forensic Architecture emerged in 2011 with funding from the European Research Council out of the context of the Centre for Research Architecture, which is at Goldsmiths, University of London. The project is led by Eyal Weisman, an architect and theorist who I believe was speaking here in September, so some of you might be, I see it, at least a, a couple of nods, familiar with his work. Um, so as Maria's already explained, the project mobilizes a whole set of different practitioners uh, so architects, artists, theorists, legal scholars, scientists, so on and so forth, to gather evidence, be it architectural or, from, or through spatial analysis, against human rights abuses, war crimes, um, human rights violations, and to present that in different legal forums. Legal forums, but also social and cultural forums. Um, the group... It, as Maria mentioned, the format has changed slightly insofar as before it was very much a research-led project, which isn't to say it isn't still, but it's actually acting more like an agency nowadays and commissioned by institutions. For instance, Amnesty International, who commissioned this year a project that was looking into um, a prison in Syria, um, Said Naya, Said, Said Naya. Um, where it's a torture prison, basically, where human rights um, observers couldn't get into that space. So often the project is operating in spaces where there are, there is no access to legal infrastructures, to justice, let's say, kind of spaces of exception when it comes to the law. And they actually took interviews from 
survivors of the prison who were able to reconstruct, through the use of sound primarily, the space in which they were held captive. So they were able to provide a kind of evidence of a place in which no actual official kind of forensic investigator could enter into to gather, gather evidence. But I think what's important for our conversation around this assembly, this notion of the assembly, is the emphasis on the notion of the forum. So forensic architecture, the word forensic in the title, it's actually closer to the original Latin word, which is forensis, which used to mean pertaining to the forum. And at the time, the forum was a legal, social, and political space. Over time, forensis has changed to mean the sort of science that we now know it as. So the science of going in and investigating a crime scene and collecting evidence. So that is usually carried out by science that is endorsed and sanctioned by the state. And the whole project of forensic architecture is actually to provide evidence that can counter the violences of the state, that can counter the claims to public truth made by the state. But the interesting thing about the notion of forensis is that often when, for instance, there is an absence of human testimonies or human survivors or witnesses, materials themselves, so architecture, for instance, but also beyond objects or even parts of the body, can be used as evidence, these inanimate materials. But actually, again, returning to the notion of the translator, these materials never quite speak for themselves. They have to have a figure, a rhetorical character, a character who can narrate, who can kind of bring to life, so to speak, who can persuade a forum that this is a certain truth claim that one can mobilize around these objects. Um, in terms of Kurdistan, there are actually some forensic architecture has been commissioned to undertake a series of investigations. Um, in Diyarbakir, Diyarbakir, or in Turkish, or Bakur in Kurdish. Um, I can't disclose any more details at this stage, but just to say that, yes, that is underway, um, and particularly relevant to the way in which forensic architecture acts, in, in a sense, as a kind of reversing of the gaze of the state. And in this context, one sees very clearly how the Turkish state is kind of weaponizing law against the Kurds. So it would be really interesting to see how This that. is fascinating, really. I, I never realized the, the real meaning of yeah, forensic yeah. architecture. And speaking of stateless democracy and the Rojava revolution, this is an important ally, yeah. right? To turn that gaze and provide evidence about the violence of the state itself. Yeah. It's, it's really quite interesting. And the way in which the state can use law, one sees this all over the world, Law in itself becomes a tool through which to wage war. So that's another oh, yeah. of the kind of paradoxes. Of Complex. The state. Yeah. Let's leave it here for a moment, and I want to use the link to the notion of forum and turn to uh, Musa. Just a, a quick introduction. Musa uh, Musa Agasarit uh, is a writer. Uh, who was from 2012 to 2016 actually a European spokesperson uh, of the national movement of the liberation of Azawad, also known as MNLA. In 2016, he founded a new organization, Free Azawad, an organization that aims to further the struggle for an independent Azawad. And as has been mentioned a couple of times, together with uh, Jonas, Jonas Dahl, he founded the New World Embassy Azawad. Uh, at Buck. I just want to turn to you first, just could you quite quickly, in a couple of words, um, introduce the struggle and perhaps also seek connections to Rojava revolution, if possible. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am very, very enjoy. Uh, to meet uh, you here. Uh, the triangle of uh, Azawadian peoples, it's uh, very similar of um, Rojava uh, people. What do you do now? Um, 
Je voudrais dire aussi, surtout, euh, vous m'excusez, je vais continuer en français, tout en remerciant bien sûr New World Summit Excuse et me. Maria, et New World Summit qui nous, qui nous permet de continuer cette aventure, parce que c'est vraiment une aventure. Juste en, en guise d'introduction rapidement de, de mon propos, je voudrais dire quelques mots par rapport au concept même d'ambassade, de, de New World Ambassade. Mais avant cela, vous me permettez aussi juste de prendre une minute de votre temps pour nous aussi, le peuple de la Zawad, euh, offrir, enfin, penser pendant une minute aux martyrs aussi de la Zawad, mais aussi de tous les martyrs de tous les peuples qui luttent pour leur liberté et leur dignité. Thank you very much. Thank you. Vous savez, les, les ambassades des peuples, c'est-à-dire les New World Embassy, ils n'ont pas de cravate, les ambassadeurs. Ils n'ont pas de salaire. Ils n'ont pas de carrière individuelle. Mais ils ont un sacrifice collectif pour un intérêt général de leur peuple. Ce que nous voulons surtout, c'est transcender les frontières et exister en tant que peuple en lutte pour sa dignité et sa liberté. Nous, de l'Azawad, vous savez, on est un peu similaire, comme je disais tout à l'heure. Nous avons, pendant tous les temps, vécu dans une sorte de confédération, de, de, en, en fait, des Touaregs, mais aussi des Amazirs, et avec tous les peuples qui vivent ensemble. Donc, en... 1960, déjà, 1960, il y a eu l'indépendance du Mali, mais nous n'avons pas été associés à cette indépendance. Donc, en 1963, nous avons fait notre première révolte contre l'État malien. Et depuis lors, nous nous battons pour l'indépendance de la Zawad. Et en 2012, en 2012, nous avons proclamé, lorsque nous avons chassé l'État malien sur notre territoire, l'indépendance de la Zawad. Et lorsque déjà, juste le, le mois suivant, c'est-à-dire nous l'avons proclamé en avril 2012, et déjà au mois de mai 2012, nous avons été invités à Berlin par New World Summit. Et là, nous avons cru que c'est possible. Avant, nous pensions, nous pensions que nous étions les seuls peuples colonisés encore. Et quand nous avons rencontré tous les autres peuples qui sont un peu comme nous, nous avons dit « Ah !» Et lorsque New World Summit et Maria avec BAC, nous avons pu créer notre ambassade. Parce que c'est vraiment l'ambassade de notre peuple soutenu par ses amis, ses vrais amis. En fait, je pense, avec l'expérience que j'ai, parce que moi j'ai une petite expérience, parce que nous sommes le premier New World Ambassade, New, premier New World Embassy of Azawad et vous, vous êtes les deuxièmes donc en fait nous sommes euh, en train de créer le nouveau monde du 21 e siècle avec ce que nous sommes en train de faire c'est un éveil et un réveil des peuples épris de paix et de justice nous sommes en train de vivre l'histoire que nous sommes en train d'écrire à la fois par notre sang et par aussi les sacrifices. Donc le New World Summit est, qui, a créé, qui, qui nous a permis de créer New World Embassy, ce sont des ambassades qui représentent des peuples, comme l'a dit tout à l'heure Madame Mohamed, ambassadeur, Excellence Mohamed. Nous ici, nous sommes en train de représenter les peuples pendant que les hommes en cravate représentent les États. D'ailleurs, nous, nous sommes en train de ramener le monde à sa propre réalité essentielle. C'est-à-dire que nous sommes des hommes et non des machines. En tant que peuple, nous pouvons prendre des engagements moraux et que nous pouvons respecter parce que ce sont des paroles données. You mentioned something really important that uh, Sinam you introduced in your speech. There is no distinction between culture and politics. 
in, um, in relation to what you said, that by building these embassies, we are essentially building a new world. A uh, new world in the own words of the 21st century, awaking, uh, a sort of awakening of people in their dignity. Now, I want you to be quite specific about what that embassy did. What did the embassy of the new world, um, a new world embassy of Azawad, what was the reaction? And where I'm heading towards is that it trembled or caused tremor far beyond what we know the world of arts and culture. So I want you to weigh on that claim that there is no distinction between culture and politics if we do our work right. En fait, ce qui s'est passé, c'est que nous avons nous aussi euh, réfléchi de façon artistique, de façon culturelle, de façon aussi euh, architecturale, c'est-à-dire les moyens d'expression des hommes, ce qui fait la différence en fait entre les hommes et les animaux. Avec euh, cette collaboration, avec ces projets, chez nous, dans la Zawad, nous avons coïncidé aussi l'ouverture du New World Embassy of Azawad à Utrecht, aux Pays-Bas, le jour de l'ouverture des négociations entre l'État malien et les mouvements de libération de la Zawad. Qu'est-ce qui s'est passé ce jour-là Ils étaient en pleine discussion lorsqu'ils ont appris qu'il y a l'ouverture d'une ambassade de la Zawad en Hollande et le chef des Nations Unies, le chef des, un des chefs des médiateurs, c'était un Hollandais. Et à la pause, ils n'ont parlé que de ça. Et ça a marqué en fait la suite. Et Maria le sait parce que les États ont été interpellés. Et nous sommes revenus au fait que, puisque c'est une initiative politico-culturelle, nous pouvons continuer. Ça crée en fait un espoir auprès de la population, auprès du peuple de la Zouad. Et ensuite, un rêve. Le rêve est tout proche. Comme on dit, le plus long voyage commence toujours par un pas. Alors si les Pays-Bas reconnaissent la Zawad, c'est déjà le début de l'indépendance de la Zawad. À la table ronde de l'ouverture, il y avait des députés des de, de Pays-Bas. Donc il y avait des représentants du peuple. Au, à Utrecht, il y avait des députés avec moi qui parlaient de l'initiative et qui, qui soutenait en fait l'initiative de, de, de New World Embassy. Donc en fait c'est une reconnaissance aussi du peuple des de Pays-Bas à l'égard de ce projet, à l'égard de ce peuple de la Zawad qui se bat pour son, sa dignité et sa liberté. Donc c'est aujourd'hui pour nous une continuité de ce projet puisque nous avons déjà avec un livre que, qui est là on a fait un livre, il y a eu un film, il y a eu New World Academy sur le projet et il y a eu aussi un déplacement de New World Summit à l'intérieur de la Zawad et il y a l'association des artistes de la Zawad qui travaille sur le terrain avec des artistes du monde entier euh, que nous avons rencontrés à Berlin lors des New World Summit à, à Berlin. Thank you. I want to turn to you, Sinem. How do you view this proposition? Because let's not forget, we're building this department for arts and culture of the New World Embassy, Rojava. Quite some statements have been made about the meaning of the embassy to which uh, Musa has contributed. How do you see the future of this embassy in that sense? And also linking to the previous conversation again, where calls were made, that actually this embassy should become permanent embassy in Oslo, but also to spread to other cities. And that I find really quite interesting proposition, starting from the space of art, art and architecture project, with this sort of a proposition. So I would want to, want to uh, get your take on uh, Musa's statement. Yes, uh, always 100 miles starts with the first step, or 1,000 miles. So we started now here. I hope we will continue. And it will be a very, very significant and important place for the people to be in 
coordinate, to collaborate with each other, to build some democracy between each other. This is what we uh, really hope to have it. Maybe here in Oslo, we'll have the, now the embassy. I would like to be last, not only for two days, of course. And we'd like to have also in other places in uh, Europe. Actually, we have the representation office in, all, in Berlin we have, in Stockholm, in Paris, <coughs> and in Netherlands, and even in uh, Moscow, in Suleimania, and so on. So we are going to uh, widen our work and contact with all the people in Europe and even uh, all over the world. That's what we would like. So even in uh, Mali, we, Azawad, sorry, <laughs> we would like to have this relation with all the people. Now we know each other. We know your culture. I have recognized when I see anybody wearing these clothes, I know he is from Azawad. Thank you so much. Fantastic. So there's a process in making. Um, I would like to um, turn to Laura. Laura Rajkovic, who's the director of the Queen's uh, Museum in New York. Um, Laura has focused on socially engaged artistic practices and runs incredibly interesting uh, program uh, in this particular museum, which itself is located in an incredibly diverse community. And although it's a very established, important, big museum, it's there to serve the people. Of course, in very different, uh, different contexts, although I don't want us to fool ourselves, even in America today, um, or specifically in America today, we're facing quite complex political situation. So I would like you to perhaps re reflect on the ambassador's opening notes and take it from there into uh, discussion of the role of art in culture strug uh, political struggles. Sure. Um, so uh, just thank you all for having me here. It's really a great honor. Um, and um, I want to start by saying that um, great art often changes the way that we see the world around us. And therefore, it is artists and art that create new openings for the way that we might imagine our futures. And that's why convening like, convenings like these are so important, because we grasp onto an idea and then we move it forward, right? Um, and in some ways, I think that uh, what you are all doing in Rojava is inventing that new world. You're making a massive art project that has many different arms and legs. And I think that artists are often driving the future, driving us to a different point. They're making us see what we didn't before. And as the director of a cultural institution, I really believe that profoundly. And so that's what I look to. Um, and I think that cultural institutions and museums particularly can not only be public spaces, places of convening, and to just touch on what we were talking about just a moment ago, Sheila, that perhaps a museum can even be an embassy. You know, that the physical location of the museum can be a site of that kind of exchange. Um, and so just a little bit about the Queen's Museum's physical history, because I think it's very important. Um, New York City has five boroughs, five areas or zones, and Queen's is one of them. And it is a very popu densely populated borough, but it is also literally the most diverse place on the planet. There are more than 165 different languages spoken in Queens. Some of those languages are no longer spoken anywhere else in the world. So the kind of cultural mixing that we have is really extraordinary. If you take the, trend, the subway to the Queens Museum, every stop is a different people that get on and off. It's really quite remarkable. So the Queens Museum is first and foremost to serve the communities that are around the museum itself. So it's very important to me that we create programs that, that speak to those realities of those people. This is really, really important. 
Um, but it also requires us to make space for imagination. So there's this constant, in really great art, I think there's this constant push and pull between imagination and usefulness, right? I mean, that's what we've been talking about today a lot, is how it makes you imagine something, makes you inspired, but also becomes useful, becomes a lever. You know, like the, the New World Summit, uh, the New World Embassy for Azawad, it was a thing that opened something new, a new, a new, uh, a new highway. Um, so just to say that the Queen's Museum itself was built in, the building was built in 1939. It was built inside a park that was itself built to be the site of the first World's Fair in New York. So already an interesting context. It was built not to be the Queen's Museum, but to be the New York City Pavilion. So the building where New York City would show off itself. Um, from 1946 to 1950, the United Nations met in that building while the UN was being built in Manhattan. And then in 1964, again, the World's Fair came back to New York somewhat controversially and, uh, and became again the site of the World's Fair and the New York City Pavilion. And the museum started uh, operating in the building not until 1972. But it is this international history, very important geopolitical decisions were made between 46 and 50 at the museum. These textures are still there. They're, re they're represented by the many different types of people that live in the vicinity of the museum. And also because people are constantly communicating with their friends and relatives halfway across the world in Queens, whatever is happening hyper-locally is also inextricably linked to what's happening halfway around the world, and we never lose that cycle. I hope I answered. How about the, how about the complex political situation? I cannot walk around it. No, we uh, have to address it. What does museum do vis-a-vis -vis such polit complex political situation? Well, I guess the first thing that I'll say is that uh, right now, um, culture writ large is at risk. Um, and when I say that, um, is that there are many people who are vulnerable in the United States now that have always been vulnerable, but now it's sanctioned vulnerability. You know, the, the, the fact that the president-elect of the United States was openly supported and endorsed by the Ku Klux Klan. You can't get around that. It's sanctioned hatred. And so, if culture defines our values and who we are and what is important to us as a society, then we have to fight for that culture. And so I think that, and also as art and culture, and particularly artists, create and distribute representation, mm. meaning how we represent our world, our ideals, our values, they become social political struggles. Social political struggles. These things are what we need to fight to preserve. And so I think that as kind of, as I might see myself as a cultural worker, along with artists and Maria and all of us in this zone, these are where our strengths lie. And if we are activated to ensure that these kinds of representations are not pushed to the side and are still held at the center, we must prevail because it's it's who we are. So insist. 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 Insistence. Persist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what does this model of Rojava revolution and stateless democracy mean for you as a director of an art institution? Well, it me means something, I think, slightly different to me now than it did before the results of the recent election. I mean, I think... As I read this book, I think um, it's something that I want to distribute to everybody who I know, <laughs> and even people I don't know. Maybe it's become obligatory reading at exactly. primary schools and all other schools across the world, I believe. Exa I totally agree. Um, because again, if you're embedded in a system, you can't necessarily see an alternative. You have to see an alternative to know what the possibilities are. This is what art does. This is what culture does. This is what this book does. This is what the Rojava revolution is doing. So in order to see that, we needed our eyes to be open. 
we need the eyes open. So let's discuss that. Let's open this floor for conversation. Join us. Are there questions at this moment? There are. Do we have mics? We do have mics. So why don't you bring them? Let's, let's take two, three questions at once. Please introduce yourself um, and address a person you want to ask the question and I'll try to keep track of it as professionally as I possibly can. Hello everyone. Um, I I'm going to try to make this very short because I'm sure you're all tired. My question is to um, Musa. Um, it's very important for me to um, ask you this question. As you know, um, I'm from North Africa as well. And uh, uh, we have the same uh, problem in North Africa as Amazigh people and native. Um, and I really, really would like to know how the international community responds now, after you had the um, uh, Azawad embassy, uh, we know very well that they always turn blind towards our demands uh, as Amazigh people in Libya or in Tunisia, Morocco, and Algeria. Uh, so how do they um, respond to your demands uh, as now you have a body that represents presumably Azawad people? And I'm talking about internationally. Let's hold on with answering. We give Musa a bit of time. There was one and there was third question here. Please, for whom do you have a question? Hi, um, my name is Bethan. Um, I'm a reporter with The Independent. Um, my question is for Sinem, actually. Um, moving away from discussing uh, fighting against the violence of the nation state and this battle for hearts and minds, even if and when ISIS is removed from Raqqa, you still have this vacuum that will be filled with more extremism and with more hatred. And in that sense, your struggle seems like it might be eternal, like completely perpetual. So two parts of my question. How is there a kind of time frame you would consider your project to be completed, a kind of a minimum standard for what you would like to achieve in, in Rojava? And how do you focus on building something sustainable when there are so many elements that want to tear it down? Thank you. Let's get the third question into the row here. Hi, um, I'm Mabel Wilson. I'm a professor at Columbia University, both in architecture and I'm a cultural historian. Um, I guess my question is for the larger panel, uh, and this goes back to Trump and the KKK, that the history of the United States um, is very, very kind of much... Um, centered in um, racial, you know, racial strife and, and racism. Our founding fathers were slaveholders, in fact. Um, so what kind of work has to be done globally to unpack white supremacy? Because that is also a part of the problem of democracy succeeding and the question of diversity. Because fundamentally, democracy, liberal democracy, set up power relations that also undermined certain beliefs. Um, that were implicit in the democratic project from the Enlightenment. Crucial. Thank you very much for these three questions. We'll answer them one after the, after the other. So I'm going to turn back to Musa. And the question was essentially, after creating this immense visibility, how did uh, the international community respond and what has been the, uh, the reaction thus far? Thank you very much. In fact, uh, les, les pays, surtout les pays qui sont colonisés, qui ont été colonisés, qui sont colonisés quelque part toujours par la France, il y a ce qu'on appelle le jacobinisme, c'est-à-dire l'État unitaire qui est sur elle-même. Il n'existe pas de, de diversité vraiment reconnue par l'État jacobin. Donc, effectivement, bon, nous, dans l'Azawad, il y a essentiellement quatre communautés ethniques. Il y a les Touareg, les Kaltamashak, les Arabes, enfin les Maures, en fait, qui parlent arabe, les Songoï et les Peuls. Les Touareg, les Kaltamashak se retrouvent 
avec les, les autres frères amazirs dans effectivement toute l'Afrique de l'Ouest ils sont originaires de l'Afrique de l'Ouest ce sont les premiers peuples de l'Afrique du Nord pardon, du Nord. lorsque nous avons proclamé l'indépendance de l'Azawad on nous dit mais si l'Azawad devient indépendant mais les Touaregs qui sont au Niger ils vont demander la même chose les Touaregs qui sont en Algérie pareil, les Touaregs qui sont au Burkina ceux qui sont en Libye et même peut-être les Amazirs qui sont en Algérie aussi. voyez Donc ils nous disent non, on oui. ne vous laisse pas devenir indépendant à cause de ça. En fait, la question de l'indépendance, c'est une question très, très, très dangereuse pour les États déjà existants. Parce qu'ils ont créé ce qu'on appelle les Nations Unies. Les, les Nations Unies qui regroupent en fait des États et qui se sont enfermés sur eux-mêmes. Ils ne veulent pas l'expression des peuples qui veulent eux aussi devenir indépendants. Ce qui s'est passé aussi, c'est qu'il y a eu l'intervention étrangère chez nous, soi-disant qu'il y a la présence d'Al-Qaïda chez nous, donc des terroristes islamistes, et ce qui leur donne la Libye, ce qui leur donne en fait l'argument pour dire « nous allons intervenir chez vous pour préserver le Mali » les états en fait et leurs médias ils ont effacé l'aspect politique de la Zawad pour dire qu'il y a un problème de sécurité, un problème de terrorisme aujourd'hui il y a une recolonisation voire une, une sous-tutelle de la Zawad mais aussi du, du Mali euh, des armées étrangères notamment l'armée française mais il y a une similitude avec les, les autres peuples comme le, les Kurdes de façon générale, c'est que nous menons une lutte légitime à laquelle le peuple croit et il est prêt à consentir les sacrifices qu'il faut. Donc on avance. Ce qui manque en fait, je pense aujourd'hui, pour les Amazirs de façon générale, mais aussi pour les Kurdes de façon générale aussi, c'est l'unité, c'est l'union, c'est la solidarité. Si tous les peuples comme nous, aujourd'hui, décidons de nous donner la main, nous pouvons créer aussi ce que nous pouvons appeler « United of New World People ». Juste une des premières choses que nous pouvons faire, par exemple, vous êtes ici témoin de cet engagement que nous pouvons prendre peut-être demain, c'est qu'à Rojava, l'Azawad est son ambassade, et dans l'Azawad, Rojava peut avoir son ambassade. We have a plan. Sinem, the question number two, very complex one that relates to time frame to complete the project and of course the question how can this project uh, become sustainable in face of enormous complex complexity that the area and the world at large, if you wish, face today? Uh, thank you for the questions about the... Uh, at asking about the, after the liberation of Raqqa, which is the capital city of ISIS in Syria. How could we change the people there? How could we build stability in this place? Uh, I would first, I would like to say one thing. Now, the liberation of Raqqa city the capital city of the Islamic State, ISIS, it's now already started to liberate it. And the leading of this campaign to liberate the Raqqa city, it's only by a Kurdish woman. She is the leader of this Raqqa city, now liberation. For me, I think, any extremist ideology, it's little bit maybe, can't be defeated military only, by the military side. Maybe, of course, for first step, but 
After the military defeated, what we need for this place, which is controlled by ISIS more than two, three years, we need to build a new society there. We need to build a new mentality there. We need to have economic support there and even work to change this mentality of people. Again, I will go back through culture, arts, poets, writers as it, novels. We have to change the mentality of the people through music also. In this way, we can do so many things. We are working, actually. The local people of the city of Raqqa, they themselves, they can administrate themselves. They will be feeling free. And to get rid of the extremist ideology, step by step, we have to build it together. Education, to let them open their eyes. Not all the people in the city, they are with the ISIS, no. But they are forced to be in this city controlled by ISIS. So we have to support them in the economic development, arts, and to have sustainable projects in this area and so that the people, the society will administrate themselves by themselves in a very successful way, as it happened in Mimbij also which was also liberated from ISIS. Uh, this is, I think, only, I can say it's a very short time for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yeah, and a difficult one. Another difficult question. Post-Trump reality, how do we actually unpacked white supremacy, which is of course not just a question uh, around, the, around the concrete situation in the United States, but penetrates so many realities. Don't forget, here in Europe, it's a complex situation that is uh, unfortunately changing the DNA of, uh, of Europe under the ultra-nationalist, fascist um, thinking. And I think we need to figure one way and another, what do we do together? And I think, Laura, I see you've got the mic, so you wanna kick off here? Well, I guess I will say that the, the circumstances in the United States are quite specific, particularly with respect to slavery and uh, of, um, of Africans. And, um, and this is a, a history and um, and the kind of legacy that we have to contend with he head on in, in the United States, and I think um, I mean on a certain level, I can't say I was shocked by Trump's election. We all know that this hatred of um, people who are uh, not members of the dominant culture get. Um, has been extant for a very long time in the United States. I think that the part that is very frightening is that now it's sanctioned, it's open, it's open season. Um, and so what can we do for each other um, who don't believe in this um, kind of uh, fascist activity? One thing that I've been thinking a lot about is um, the kind of larger multicultural project um, of kind of uh, embracing difference in a very important way. And the fact that facing race as an issue in the United States is primary among the things that we need to address. And I think something that's been reflected in the conversations about Azawad and Rojava has to be our willingness to make sacrifices. And I think that's core to that conversation. And I think it's also relative not only to issues of race, but also to questions of indigeneity. Um, because of course, the history of the United States is also highly problematic <clears throat> in its relationship to the indigenous people um, of North America. So to talk from a museum's perspective as an institution, one of the questions that I'm always trying to ask myself is how do I undo or use 
or, or how do I look at the museum as a place that has reified and reinforced over time the, the ideals of the larger culture, and how do I begin to subvert its, the museum's own authority within my power? And so, to me, that's part of how I try to contend with these very kind of negative forces, the things that I think are highly problematic. Um, Particularly when people ask me a question like, well, how can you, isn't a museum supposed to be a neutral place? Isn't that, uh, how can you be so political within the context of your museum? And my answer is, well, museums have always been political spaces. They're spaces of reinforcing the ideologies of the dominant culture. So what I'm trying to do is invert that equation. So I guess, I mean, this is an incomplete answer to your question, Mabel, obviously. But these are fraught and difficult times. And I think that ultimately, the solidarity that we can bring across different struggles between Native American causes and what's happening at Standing Rock right now and Black Lives Matter movement and what's happening in Rojava and Azawad, I think these are connections that are both national and extraterritorial. Thank you, Lara. I think we are in the world where only incomplete answers are possible. And I think we need to learn living with it and try none of the less. But maybe, Sheila, you want to weigh in? Um, thank, you for the, <clears throat> thank you for the question. I think it's fantastic. Um, OK, I'm going to say a few things that I think are probably really obvious. But I think in times like these, we do need to repeat the obvious. And also, following on from Laura, how do we pick up elements from each of the different projects? Um, I was just thinking I hadn't realized that the museum in Queens was built in a park that was originally intended for the World Fair. So I think, first of all, we need to think in the current context of the construction of public truths as if they are truths, cultural and social and racial truths, sort of assumptions about superiority, also in light of this post-truth, post quote-unquote, context we're in, we need to think about the role of display and visualization, which is exactly what the museum's about, right? So the World Fair is precisely the place where the world or the world to be colonized or the supposedly inferior or exotic races are displayed, and that's part of the whole mechanism that creates them as... Um, as others, let's say. Um, so there's a lot more to, to say on that line in terms of sort of visual construction and framing and display. Going back to uh, the Kurdish context, what really struck me about the women's movement and what's called genealogy, or gen, the Kurdish word for women, and then logos, the Greek knowledge, is the way in which it doesn't, it doesn't, in a knee-jerk way, simply dispute science or the way or the sort of possibilities opened up by science. And I say this because one can see in so many different contexts the way in which science operated by the state or in the name of the state or in the service of the state is used to construct what is then circulated as a supposedly objective truth. So we see this historically with the construction of race with the construction of gender and sexuality. You know, we can look back retrospectively and see exactly how that was constructed through a combination of science and visual representation, which doesn't mean that science and visual representation are bad. We just need to somehow work back within them um, in order to critique. And then also from the um, Kurdish context, I think, and what you were saying about the politics of recognition, what's really productive about the Kurdish context is that there's a real drive, in the sort of absence of any imminent recognition from other states or international bodies, the whole point, it seems to me, is that there's the creation of a new society through, first of all, self-recognition. And that, in the context of anti-colonialism or post-colonialism, is incredibly instructive. How do you begin or create a new society that is self-sustaining 
um, that doesn't, that isn't simply a reaction against an enemy. So it's not simply responsive, it's actually creative and affirmative in itself. Um, and I say that because I think it links to white supremacy insofar as what we see in the Kurdish context. I mean, obviously there's differences, but there's a similar kind of impetus. What we see in the uh, context of the Kurdish struggle is this real uh, drive to first of all decolonize the self and decolonize the internal community in order to be self-sustaining. And we see this very much with white supremacy and racism that it's a complete, I mean, the way I read it at least, it's a complete lack of imagination within the self. So that brings us back to the arts as well. Um, and it seems like that's what's necessary, first of all, a first, an internal decolonization. Thank you, Sheila, for weighing in. Would you like to weigh in, uh, Moussa? Moi, ce que je voulais dire par rapport au au racisme aux états unis surtout aussi dans le reste du monde, notamment en Europe où il y a des expressions qui se font entendre par les, les, les élections qui portent des candidats qui sont, je dirais pas racistes directement, mais qui laissent s'exprimer le racisme. C'est qu'on est arrivé peut-être au sommet de quelque chose et c'est en train de, de tomber. Maybe Donc maintenant c'est à nous de créer un nouveau monde pour euh, aller plus loin. Quand on voit ce qui se passe aux états unis mais aussi quand on voit ce qui s'est passé récemment en Angleterre, notamment les Brexit, on s'est dit l'Union européenne est en train de s'effondrer. Le pays, ou en tout cas la fédération de pays la, le plus, qui inspire le plus le monde, c'est-à-dire les états unis d'Amérique, est aussi en train, quelque part, de s'effondrer. On se pose des questions. En fait, c'est l'argent qui est en train de commander les, les expressions et les sentiments des hommes politiques. Et je vous donne un petit exemple, c'est Standing Rock. Standing Rock, rock actuellement, c'est-à-dire les, les indigènes, les autochtones euh, aux états unis à Dakota, qui sont en train de, de, de se battre les mains nues. Vous comprenez le, la situation Ils veulent faire un néolodique qui va traverser les régions des, des Indiens d'Amérique, c'est-à-dire des Autochtones. Moi, je pense que pour surmonter cette difficulté, cette période de notre histoire, il faut trois ou quatre choses. C'est-à-dire que le, la machine, l'argent, nous a apporté à un certain niveau où nous devons maintenant nous poser la question d'où nous venons puisqu'en fait c'est un peu comme si on ne sait plus où on va donc il faut vraiment de l'éducation une éducation qui s'inscrit dans l'écologie c'est à dire la terre revenir sur la terre et surtout regarder les autres c'est à dire nous ouvrir sur les autres euh, nous ouvrir aux autres comprendre que l'autre il est comme moi si je le pince il va dire aïe moi aussi si on me pince je vais dire aïe donc on est pareil, on est les mêmes. Donc positive, positive action. Thank you very much, uh, Moussa. Also for mentioning education, mentioning the notion of ecology, and for you, Sheila, bringing the, the notion of genealogy, the women's science. And I think this brings us back to stateless democracy propositions, and specifically um, the women's science is a really interesting resource of thinking. Uh, about this. So I would like to offer a word to you, Sinam, before we conclude this panel. Thank you. Uh, I can answer in just a few words. If we want, what do we want with each other, from each other? To live in a better world. The democratic nation, it is the solution. Nobody will deny anybody. No one can say you are black, you are white, you are so and so. You are Kurds, you are Arabs. You are whatever you are. It is the democratic nation which depends on the policy of the equal genders, on the policy of equality between all these nations, 
on the policy of each one having his own rights, his cultures, his language, and it, I can say it is on the policy of unity through di diversity. This is the only things I can say. And with the women also, as a woman, if whether, where, wherever these women are, if they are Kurdish women in Rojava, or in United States as an American woman, or here in Europe, all the women should be together to collaborate, to make a very, very good and beautiful world together. We can together climb to the top of the mountain. Thank you so much. Now on that note, I know there are many more questions, but we have an informal evening together, so there will be opportunity for all of us to reach towards whomever we wish and discuss these things further. Just by way of very impromptu makeshift conclusion, I, um, I hope you're joining me in appreciating extraordinary contributions to this panel where we discuss the notion of art and culture in the process of self-determination. We called for a new world, we called for a better world, and we also understood here in collectivity that we only can do it together if we recognize similarities in, uh, in our respective struggles. Now, there were very concrete propositions. We're going to build more embassies, some new world embassy of Rojava in Azawad and other way around. There were propositions of understanding how solidarity could work, not only between or among different struggles we had here, we had here uh, in, uh, uh, at, the, at the table, but many other struggles in the world because there are enormous com communality. We discuss art and culture as a space where things can happen where things can be pre-configured, like this embassy coming as an art project and becoming more and more real. We discuss the space of art, or we discuss art as uh, practice, or something that you, Sinem, called for, art as an attitude towards the world in which we are, in order to build new ways of being together, ways of being together in this world otherwise. And perhaps um, the very last thing I could do is to return to Jonas Stahl and quote his, his closing words from his essay to this stateless democracy reader. What is the task of art in times of emergency, he asks in relation to the Rojava revolution. The artists and educators of Rojava seem to provide an answer to write, imagine, and enact history according to the stateless. Not only people's forced into statelessness, but in the case of Rojava, those who have decided to live without the state. And if Jonas calls for writing a history according to the stateless, I would like to invite all of us to decide the present according to the stateless and the future as much so. Thank you very much. Thank you, the panelists, and all of you.